uh, it's really a pleasure for me to introduce, uh, introduce once again uh, Rabbi Mark uh, Gopin. And uh, how many of you have heard Mark speak uh, High Holidays or here before over the years? So uh, we were really lucky that Mark is living in, in our community. Uh, his son, I just found out this morning, is Levac Isaac. Would you please uh, take a bow? Um, he, he attends BCC High School. And he's like, you know, like uh, on, the, on the baseball team, and he's here today to uh, go practice with his baseball team. Um, and he's a big Nats fan, I understand. Any other Nats fans here? Okay. So, so just quickly, oh, what's this? Um, so quickly, Mark, uh, I'll try and keep it short because it's, it's running late. Uh, Mark, um, I, if I'm, I hope I'm not, not wrong. Grew up in the Boston area? Boston, I got that right. Uh, and, but he attended a, a university, Columbia University, uh, graduated in 79 from the university and then uh, went to Yeshiva University. Um, and is that what you majored, majored in? Uh, you got your PhD from Yeshiva, is that right? Brand. From Brandeis, PhD in Near Eastern Studies and Jewish, Jewish philosophy. All right. Uh, Mark is the uh, director of um, the Center for, if I get this right, Conflict Resolution. I, I think I, I always get the, the name wrong. I really should read my notes. Oh, <laughs> it has a lengthy name. Center for World Religions, Diplomacy, and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. And uh, he's uh, initiated numerous um, efforts of peace building in the Middle East, has been to Syria a number of times, has been to Jordan, throughout the Middle East, and Israel, Palestine as well. Um, and has also, he, he's written a book on, is it uh, Samuel Luzato, which came out last year? Okay. Last year, um, a, a major philosopher. Uh, and anyway, so without any further ado, we're so happy to have you here with us, Mark. Let's give Mark a good welcome. Um, well, uh, what I want to talk about today is that I've, um, you know, I, my journey continues. I've, I've worked for 30 years in, in uh, Israel, uh, Palestine, between the sides uh, since the 1980s, uh, working on peace building with peace builders on both sides, and sometimes with back channel diplomacy with leaders, as you know from the, the times I've talked. And about 15 years I've worked uh, inside Syria before the revolution, before the catastrophe in 2012, and I worked on peace building between, in an interfaith way, between uh, Syrian citizens, and as a way of, of indirectly building democracy, uh, inequality of rights, and feminist equality, many, many things that we worked on before the revolution. Uh, since the revolution, it took, a, it took a catastrophic turn, because what people don't understand is that from all sides, uh, no one wants uh, an Arab democracy. Uh, no one wants a Palestinian democracy. And so basically, the wonderful people inside Syria who fought for democracy were being killed by everyone. They were being killed by Turkey, by Saudi, by Qatar, by, uh, by certainly by Iran and Russia. And basically, it was a catastrophe uh, for anybody who was a Democrat, anybody who was a progressive. Uh, but I worked with all of those people, and I loved them, and I continued a relationship with them. And we didn't know what to do with uh, a situation where no side was good. Uh, everybody, everybody was harming uh, innocents. And we, uh, and we figured, well, what could we do? So I basically left uh, being willing to go inside the country, because that would be with the regime. And I worked with the refugees, about a million in Jordan, a million in Turkey, uh, a million in Lebanon, and we, we, we inched our way, or felt our way, towards basically focusing on children and women. And the reason for that is because most wars are generated um, by power structures that focus on men and male fighters, and male power structures, and women are uh, at best set aside, at worst are basically objects of conquest uh, both uh, physically and sexually. And that, 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 that space of victimhood, but also being set aside, um, was an opportunity for, for, for what we were trying to do, which was how to rebuild uh, a country and a society when the men were going at each other completely, and thousands of proxy warriors and thousands of proxy actors were getting them to kill each other. And so in that situation of complete 
ethical failure of the world, uh, we asked ourselves, what is there ethically to do? And that brought me back to, um, to my origins in the study of ethics and psychology that I had been doing since I was 10. Uh, you know, since I was 10 years old, I was asking a lot of basic questions, as a lot of you were when you were 10 about post-Holocaust Jewish life. You know, what is it to be in a world that just did that? And, and uh, I studied psychology a great deal. I studied Viktor Frankl. I studied uh, uh, so many of the great psychologists, both Jewish and non-Jewish, so many of the great philosophers. And I asked myself very fundamental questions about what it is that's possible to do in a broken world, particularly a world in which there are no political sides that are good, uh, which, which uh, uh, is happening to some degree today as well. So it certainly was with Syria. I couldn't explain to people that to just knee-jerk on the left, to knee-jerk oppose American involvement because of other American crimes in Iraq and other places was to misunderstand the gravity of the genocidal situation of what the regime was doing to people. 500,000 dead, 12 million out of homes, 20, 30,000 being tortured to death in prisons. It was the, the, the enormity of it was something that the left couldn't handle either because they didn't have a clear enemy. And basically, from what we know from psychology is that people are, uh, people need an enemy. Uh, one of my colleagues, a great Cypriot Turkish psychiatrist, uh, wrote a book called The Need to Have Enemies and Allies. That, that we need in our primal space, especially when things get very confusing, to figure out who's the bad guy. The thing that sells all movies is that there's a good guy and there's a bad guy, in all genres. Because that's where we go in our primal space when we don't know what to do. So what I started to realize when I, when I was working with Democrats in Israel and in Palestine and in Syria, who were basically being assaulted if not murdered by everyone, was that clearly there are people in this universe over the last 300 years, but maybe thousands of years since Socrates in Athens, who don't go to who's the good guy and bad guy, who have something else going on in their brain. And I ask more <laughs> fundamental questions about why some of us graduate to a sense of gray areas and a moral maturity that leads to um, compassion, reason, compromise, and others don't. And why in some periods more of us do that, and in other periods it's very, very few, and they're on the run because everybody's trying to kill them, like in World War II and, and, and everywhere you can imagine. I said, why, what's the difference? So that led me, in the last few years, into a focus on back to philosophy and ethics, but with an attachment to the latest neuroscience that is helping us understand thousands of years of ethical reflection that didn't make sense before. It was just good philosophers thinking in different ways and having debates about what to do. But we didn't connect it with what's going on in our minds and, our, and what, what we metaphorically call our hearts, but what we know is all up here. And I, so I started investigating that. And when I published uh, or republished and evolved the book that I wrote, on Samuel David Luzzato, I called it Compassionate Judaism. Because Samuel David Luzzato was a, a Jewish philosopher from the first half of the 19th century. He was the foremost biblical scholar of his time. And he was, he was orthodox. He was pretty, I'm not, you know, I, I, I grew up in orthodoxy, I come out of orthodox training, but I don't, uh, uh, I don't believe in any denominations and any boundaries, and I, and I, I don't like that kind of tribal thinking. So I, I'm not like that. But, but Lutzada was a real warrior for orthodoxy, and yet at the same time, he was very super liberal biblical interpreter. He was the foremost Bible interpreter of his generation. And what he saw in the Bible from, and that he was in, in conversation with, for him, went exactly to cutting edge ethical theory of the last few hundred years of one particular school. And that particular school is called Moral Sense Theory. And it was Francis Hutchinson and the third Earl of Shaftesbury and a series of others that focused on pro, what we call today psychologically pro-social emotions as the core of ethical theory. And that is 
that our goal is to train ourselves from the time we are extremely little, and that's why education and training, a la John Dewey and others, is the core of ethical success, according to this theory, is the key, is the cultivation of the higher social emotions, particularly compassion, and that compassion motivates all pro-social behavior. So Lutzada wrote enormously on Judaism, demonstrating in many, many places in the Bible why that is the core of Judaism, of compassion Judaism. You can read the book uh, if you want to see all the proofs. It's really quite brilliant, uh, both biblically and rabbinically. But that wasn't all. You see, Lutzado, and this is what gnawed at me. I don't know if that's a... I, it was gnawing at me as I spent years on this wonderful uh, philosopher, uh, was that he was also... There were real flaws in his thinking and in his practice. He was filled with compassion for poor people. He was filled with compassion for poor, poor Jews, poor Gentiles. He was from the villages inside in, 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 in uh, Italy, and in a very humanist way. He had a very close relationship with the farmers and with poor people, and that was great. But ask him a complicated question about people in the cities or reform Judaism, and he, 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 went, he went crazy. And he started fighting and fighting, and so the compassion left him and other things took over in his letters. And I was troubled by that. Because I was like, what, what's, where, where's his reasoning going? And why did he hate Mendelssohn? And why did he hate Kant? And I started to look into all of this, and I realized that the brain is a very funny thing. And moral sense theory is wonderful, but you can't just focus on one emotion. It doesn't work that way. And, and Aristotle understood this, Socrates understood this, Kant certainly understood this, that basically, if we over-focus on one emotion, we can end up being the opposite of what we hope to be. I'll give you an example. If you love America too much, you end up hating the rest of the world. Now, while you're, while you're loving America, and you're loving firefighters and police, and you're honoring veterans, and that's all beautiful and wonderful, but that excessive empathy with one leads to suspicion, harshness, hatred of the other. If you love Palestinians too much, and you feel their pain, and you get to know them like I did, you, you, you can end up hating Jews per se, because that emotion of compassion brings you with such empathy to who they are that you forget all the other complicated circumstances. And it's the same, the opposite, with Jews loving Jews so much that they end up, this is why it, it was why it pained me when I met Mayor Kahana, one of the worst Jews in the 20th century, one of the biggest criminals in the 20th century, a hater, an inciter to violence. He's responsible for the hate groups in Israel. And he, he was a Bostonian, though. Well, he wasn't a Bostonian, he was a New Yorker, but he came to Boston. And I met him, and I fought him at Brandeis University publicly rabbi to rabbi, and, and it was extremely painful to me after humiliating him in public with proof texts that showed that he was wrong in front of 400 screaming happy liberal Jews who were happy that somebody was defending them, that the day, the night that he was murdered, I, 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 was, I was just devastated, you know, because just, just to hate and just to be compassionate for one side was not enough. It was a failure for, the, for his life to end in assassination. Right? So I started to look into all of the different ethical schools and I, and, of, of late. And then I started to study neuroscience. Uh, and I realized that there is some exciting thing going on between the fact that we've had three or four or five schools of ethical thought for, for, for thousands of years, and that the brain welcomes multiple ethical schools to struggle with each other in deliberation. And I came up with something called compassionate reasoning. And I realized that the brain, if it's excessive in empathy, it goes off the rails. If it's excessive in reason, and rationality, it can go off the rails because every PhD in physics just can't resist figuring out another nuclear weapon. <laughs> you know, we Jews, we're, we're just intoxicated by, by, you know, in Israel, you walk around, people, there are people who have three, four, five PhDs. 
in the older generation. You know, we have this thing going on with our brains that's just like nonstop. And without careful deliberation, the lure of reason and rationality can lead you to the end of your society. There are 88,000 chemicals that are unregulated in our, in our society. All of them made by brilliant chemists who are just following their expertise in rational chemistry. One of those is C8. C8 is Teflon. C8 has, has ruined the lives of thousands of human beings around the world. And DuPont is so corrupt on this that virtually everybody in the world today has C8 in their blood, which wasn't the case just 60, 70 years ago. And it causes lots of problems. It's not just one unregulated chemical. Who created those chemicals? Who created the fertilizers? Who created uh, Zyklon B gas for World War II? Very rational chemists. So we can't just be rational. We also have to be compassionate. We can't just be rational and compassionate and think of principles like my principles of going to my, my physics uh, classes and becoming a brilliant physicist. We also have to be a third thing, and that's called consequentialism. We have to calculate consequences. And that's the basis of a whole school called utilitarianism and consequentialism, which means you can't just stick to principles. You also have to think of consequences. So these are at least three schools of ethics that I, I found the balance of them would be interesting for how we evolve in the future as Jews, as, as uh, citizens of the earth. Then I got shocked by how much the, the, the new neuroscience is helping to explain a lot of this. So I'll, I'll show you a couple of, well this is uh, the book I'm contemplating, wait a second. So the book I'm contemplating is called Being Good, The Art of Making Moral Choices uh, in a Complicated World. And compassionate reasoning is something I've written on and published on that I'm looking at as a combination of these different schools. And I'm arguing that the more that we train our children and ourselves in the art of complicated ethical thinking from the earliest age, the more that something remarkable happens to our brain we become more and more immune to excessive obedience to demagogues. We become more and more balanced before we take any actions. And these things work in combination, and we learn to respect the fact of live and let live that we may come to different conclusions about the same issue based on the different school of thought that we're emphasizing, and that we're gonna to have to live with that. In other words, there are things in life that are great. There is no simple answer to a dictator in the Middle East killing 500,000 people, and at the same time, our record of getting everyone killed by invading. Those are two facts, and they don't lead to a simple solution. They require deliberation. They require reasoning. They also require compassion for everyone who's a victim. And even compassion for the, the aggressors. We know Israel has been painted, or Israelis have, well, let's put it this way. There's a lot of crimes in Israeli history. We know that. But we also know that there's a lot of crimes all over the Middle East that are not every day at the United Nations. And that's odd. And smacks of anti-Semitism or manipulation, emotional manipulation. So it's complicated. How do you get people into the complicated space of deliberating in a way that compromise can happen and better solutions can happen without rage, without anger, without demonization. So it turns out that there's some very interesting work being done. I'll give an example. This is an article called The Limbic System, Limbic Reasoning, Limbic Resonance, sorry. Limbic Revision, Limbic Resonance. And basically, it's about the fact that, that there's a limbic system in several parts of our brain near the brain stem, the amygdala and several others, that are involved in how we survived as animals in the woods, 
always being chased, always being in danger. And it's a very sophisticated system of how you're on alert and how you survive uh, any danger. And that we have millions of years of experience in that. Unfortunately, it's a part of the brain that if you go through that as a child, or if you have a, a bad partner, or if you're constantly assaulted with a sense of danger and insecurity, that part of your brain, we now know, literally grows. It's literally bigger between people. On a microscopic level, there's literally addition to different portions of the brain based on how much you're reinforcing it. So if you look at the amygdala and hippocampus and the hypothalamus, they're all deep inside the brain. And they, and they help you to uh, withdraw from the world and run or kill. Okay, so it's a basic survival system. And it messes up all the other parts of the brain because you're busy with that. And the more it's strengthened and the worse people's lives are, the more they're prone to that way of reacting to the world. And what happens is, is that you become a slave to that brain stem. You no longer have free choice. You are, your mouth is moving, but you're not making choices. Your mouth, you, you, your mouth can be based on the deliberation of your mind, or it can be just an expression of your rage or your fear. We all know this, yeah, especially, you know, Jews, we talk too much. So we know that sometimes we're talking out of considered reasoning, and a lot of times we're just talking and say, why did I say that? Right? Because you're talking, but you're not thinking. So something else is pushing you in that direction. So the art of training the brain in a different way is something that we believe now, as opposed to a lot of determinism in history, we now believe that it's quite eminently possible to train the mind in compassion, for example. And this lady, um, uh, this amazing lady, uh, Olga Klemecki, has demonstrated, let me just see if I can get up some of her, Neuroscience of Compassion, Olga Klemecki, and several other researchers. I'm trying to, going to try to get to some of her, see if I can get. Oh, this is, the, this is it, right? So look at this. So one of the things that it takes to truly understand the benefits of compassion and compassion training is that there are two things that we mix together in our language that now the scientists are arguing should not be mixed together. And those two things are compassion versus empathy. Those two words were synonyms throughout history. But as we started to look at the brain, we started to realize that those are two different pathways. One of them is very social, and one of them ends up very antisocial. And it's called empathic distress. She calls it personal distress. And, and if you look at the, the pathway, and they did this through proving, through training and through tracking the brains, where the brain lights up, okay? So you can train somebody in feeling terrible for suffering that they're seeing. And that's called empathy of distress. But then you can train them in joy and love and good actions and, and things that they visualize, and that's called the empathy of compassion. Two entirely different parts of the brain. And the part of the brain that's in empathic distress leads you to withdraw from society, withdraw from friends, become angry, antisocial, develop a whole series of emotional and physical problems. Anyone who's done the kind of work I did in war zones, anybody who's done emergency rooms without training, without working on themselves, has this PTSD. And that is self-related emotion, negative feelings, withdrawal. Whereas compassion training leads to other related emotion, positive feelings, and pro-social motivation. So it turns out that an awful lot, and this I'll get personal for a minute, in my childhood, my, my mother, <clears throat> my mother uh, was, she came to be in the middle of the depression in absolute poverty with a mostly absent and uncaring father. Total, total poverty. 
And um, her mother had narrowly been escaped Cossacks in Europe and, and had you know, some trouble and was working and slaving in factories in the 1920s, 1910s. In addition, she only had one other brother who was four years old when he was killed by an accident. And he had, his, her mother never forgave her father for, for that. They divorced. And they were, it was very bitter. They were not allowed, she was not allowed to see her father. She, he didn't want to see them and so on and so forth. Although that's the narrative that she got. The point is that I grew up between this and the Holocaust and that trauma of poverty and loss with an obsession all the time with the loss of a child. It's not an accident that I spent three years being traumatized, five years, in working with Syrian survivors and children. Every single time, playing with all of those kids, doing very positive things for them, and I was crying all the time. All the time. Jordan, Turkey, risking our, my life to go to them with all of these little kids. So was I doing myself a favor? Hard to say, maybe not, because I did it in a weird way. I was obsessed with the kids. I brought tons of people to help those kids. I brought aid to those kids. But as soon as I could, I ran to my room and stayed by myself, because I was in a state of advanced empathic distress and trauma. And I was getting sicker and sicker and so on. So what Olga and, and Tanya Zinger and others are arguing is that we have mistaken the positive emotion of empathy, which my guy Lutzato, Samuel David Lutzato, he had that feeling of sadness for the poor and for tragedy up the gazoo. And, and it explains now why he was so angry at everyone all the time. Because angry, if you have so much empathy for suffering, I couldn't stop thinking about the Holocaust. I know everything about the Holocaust. When I was 10 years old, I was already immersed. Why? Because I got socialized into focusing on empathic distress. And I think many, many Jewish people know what I'm talking about. As opposed to the mitzvah, you know, the mitzvah is, is Abbas Keset. It's the love of compassion. That's how you imitate God. You don't imitate God by falling apart and feeling terrible all the time and having nervous breakdowns and, and uh, ulcerative colitis. That, that's not an imitation of God. Imitation of God is an overwhelming sense of love and compassion. At least that's what the text said. So how did we end up with this other kind of Jewishness? And we're not the only ones. This is very, very common. And I can now I've gotten so good at this, I can tell immediately what somebody's childhood was like when I'm in a war zone, and I see what they focus on when they talk to me. You know, and some of them have lost 40 members of their family, just like the Holocaust. There's so many people walking around. It's exactly their Holocaust. And you can see which ones are dealing with it in a healing way, and which ones are getting into trouble, and even suicidal with uh, risking their lives to fight ISIS, to fight this one, to fight that one and it had to do with a lot of stress and trauma in the family system before the war. So the self-examination, the chinas and nefesh that I've argued, you know, that, I've, that I've mentioned and all of our great religious ethical traditions emphasize is self-examination. Self-examination turns out to be the brain controlling itself. When, when I say, when I, when I just shout at you, you know, and I say, 50,000 tortured in Syria. What? So my what the fuck is my, my brain emoting into my mouth. But the moment I say, I feel angry about this, that's my prefrontal cortex examining my amygdala. I'm already in more in control by trying to reason through what is happening to me right now. Every time I go to Israel, I get uh, colitis. Oh, huh, interesting. Okay, so, so that, you know, that's interesting. But that's my prefrontal cortex examining 
and I'm already more in control. And that's what Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher, wanted. He wanted us to be in our highest possible brain, which for him expressed itself in one simple, simple ethical command, which we have from Leviticus and from Exodus. And that is, love others as you would want to be loved yourself. Do not do unto others what you would not want done to them. Hilla. Care for your enemy because you were like them at one time. Care for the stranger, even though care for the person who has no property. Now you have property. Care for the one that doesn't have property because you used to be in Egypt and you didn't have any property. Empathy, compassion, but not the negative kind, but the positive overflowing kind. So this is a way in which compassion can marry itself to a Kantian principle, which is think about ways to be in the world that are consistent for all people, regardless of who they are. That's basically Kantian ethics. And everything we do in terms of civil rights is basically comes out of the last few hundred years of evolution of democratic thinking, Kantian thinking, that has now gone way beyond Kant and Jefferson, because Kant and Jefferson had their own problems with the limitation of that principle to white men, white men with property, uh, people who were not savages. Kant has the word savages in his writings. Jefferson, we know. So the principles that they came up with already in Socrates' time is still evolving for all of us into a more logical and logical progression to what true universal principles are. And that's the brain improving upon itself in an ideal way. Our challenge, of course, is that so many people's brains are totally screwed up on this. We have, the, the men, mostly the men who created the democratic structures of the United States in 1776, they didn't create an educational system that would make sure that each one of our brains in childhood would be acculturated to this. We just said this is a great idea and we're gonna let the lawyers work it out. There's gonna be all these lawyers in Congress and they're gonna do great. And it was a complete ignorance of the way in which the brain needs habits. Kant was somewhat aware of this. Lusato was very aware of this. And now the neuroscientists have confirmed it. There's no way to get to this level of nonviolence without training from childhood. Training and compassion. Training and reasoning. I'll give you an example of training and reasoning that I think, I, I don't know if I, I told you about it here, but um, if you, uh, um, Basically, training and reasoning would happen in the prefrontal cortex here. Training and compassion is sort of all over the brain. And I think I told you that in, um, in Syria, the very same Syria that managed to, managed to have one of the biggest uh, genocides in modern history, uh, half the people of an entire country out of their homes, the same place in, Syria, in Damascus, the capital, there were kindergartens that were teaching exactly this to children. There was one kindergarten that did something in the kindergarten that is the cutting edge of theory on how we change for the better. And it was a kindergarten that taught something called a mediation corner. They had a corner of the kindergarten where when two children were having a fight, they knew, they were told by the authority figure, the teacher, which is your world in kindergarten, right? Your teacher is your world. The teacher says to you, when you have a fight, go to that corner, talk about the fight. If you can See if you can work it out. If you can't, then call me. Okay, think about this on a neuroscience level. You have a five-year-old brain that's just beginning to map out the world. And that five-year-old now knows that there's an authority that wants compassion, understanding, and reasoning. The moment you feel a fight coming on, like a cold, like a bad cold. And, and that person is instructing you that there is a geographic space in your mental map of the world 
where mediation is going to happen. Imagine what American political society would look like right now if every single kindergartner had a mental map of the world where mediation happens over here. Even the, that it's a part of the construct of reality. Going back to childhood. Imagine knowing that there's a figure in your life that says, suppress your rage right here, wait till you get to the corner, and then articulate why you feel angry, which is already a victory for the prefrontal cortex. Even if, if they go there and they say the angry things, they have graduated from that moment of hitting right back to, to holding it for a bit and going over the corner. They were teaching this in a kindergarten in Damascus. And I know this because I knew that I had friends. My friends had, there was a, a couple that took their kids out of the school because they said, we don't apologize to anyone. Because the mediation corner was a space of apology too, right? Apology, forgiveness. And they took their kids out because they said, we don't apologize to anybody. Who was that couple? It was Assad's family. <laughs> it was Assad's family. He was later blown up by a bomb, probably by Assad himself. But they were the ones that were orchestrating all of this. And they, you see, in that moment, in that classroom, Assad was defeated. He couldn't even kill them because all they did was make a mediation corner in the kindergarten. There was no attack on him as president. There was no attack on his corrupt system of making money and on the first hundred families. All they did was have a mediation corner. So instead of shooting up the classroom, which I fully expected they were capable of, they left saying, we don't participate because we don't apologize to anybody. I said, ah, oh, that's, that's defeat. That's victory for a certain way of thinking. Very nonviolent, very unattacking, extremely subversive. extremely subversive, but the demonstrations in 2011, which I begged them not to go to, because I knew that the demonstrations were the product of this delusion we have over the last hundred years that we have sold to many people, that you go out and demonstrate in masses and everything's gonna work out. Just like it worked out in 1917 in Moscow, when the women laborers started the whole thing nonviolent democratic women laborers. Just like it worked out in Tehran in 1979. All these wonderful Democrats that come to me now with regrets, saying we were used, we were hijacked. Palestinians have said the same thing to me. Because mass demonstration and nonviolent resistance at that level saying the dictator must go is please shoot me here. And that's exactly what Assad's forces did. And that's exactly what the Muslim Brotherhood wanted, because the Muslim Brotherhood has an extremely primitive notion of, of either they're in power with their secular regimes or we're in power. So let's get the masses to resist, let their children be shot, and let the Arab Spring begin. And in most places it failed miserably, because it was a direct assault on Assad, and he loves that. Dictators love to be attacked, because that's their game but a corner in a, in a kindergarten classroom. If you can get it legislated across states, that's, that's victory. So I'm rethinking what it is to overcome the bad in us. I'm rethinking the fact that with the right circumstances, some societies persist in racism and hatred decade after decade after decade, and then somehow some, like in Germany, they turn around on a dime because it turns out that the people who seized power in Germany and demagogued their way into mass, mass murder, they were one side of Germany. But there was a whole other side of Germany for hundreds of years that was developing the democratic ideas of the, of the Immanuel Kants. And once fascism was utterly defeated, we saw a whole turnaround that does not make any sense unless you start thinking of the neuroscience, unless you thought, start thinking of education what happened differently in each place that could turn around one society but leave another society completely stuck in perpetual problems.
perpetual hatred. So that's what I'm thinking about these days. Um, and I'm thinking that, going back to my paradigm, I'm thinking about how to build the future in a way that we can figure out how to deliberate together on ethical choices we face that's going to, on the contrary, raise us up to a higher level of our brain, of our care, of our principles, of our compassion, and our mapping out of consequences. And see if that's gonna help a very troubled American society. But fundamentally, it's gonna to have to begin much earlier with education of the human mind and safe spaces of healing and love as a, uh, a preparation of the human mind to, to, uh, to be more ethical in a very complicated world. So that's what I'm thinking about, and we can have a talk about it. Thank you. I want to make a space now for um, questions. I'm going to take this out. Psychologists are very divided on this, and, and they put themselves out of business if they say it's all over. <laughs> uh, and, but I honestly, I mean, I think, I think there's an acknowledgement that when people have that training and preparation early on and that sense of safety, it's easier for them to get through life. And for others, it's a constant struggle with trying to, 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 plan, to, to retrain. But what Olga's work proved, the reason why she's so excited about the research, is that within a matter of days, you can rewire the brain towards compassionate uh, thinking. By, uh, a, 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 and I've tried it on myself a few times, because I'm a, I'm a really bad test case. I have, I have really bad problems with thinking in compassion versus empathy. I'm, I'm excessively empathic, and I take in everybody else's trouble. And, I, and it's physically, I mean, sometimes one of my kids will say, oh, this, this uh, you know, that, I said, what's that black and blue? I said, oh, this happened. And they describe it, and I get a sharp pain in my stomach. It's like, it's involuntary. And I realize, you know, basically what, what, the, what the psychologist is saying is that this isn't helping anybody. And the ethicists say the same thing. Compassion helps people. Empathic distress doesn't help anybody. In fact, it's going to make you deliver worse your ability to parent, take care of people, etc. But what's been shown is that with practice and effort, you can enlarge that part of your compassionate thinking. So Olga had people meditate for several days in a very interesting way on choosing the happiest, most loving experience they've had with people in their lives. And, and focus, you know how you focus in meditation on your breathing? And the whole thing to calm you down is to not think about anything else. And so it's hard work, right? And the more you do it, the better your brain gets. And it's the same with compassion training, is that the more you think about those images of something ideal in your life that was so wonderful, um, and the more that you remember it every day, it seems to grow that part of your brain. And, and then, and then you, they, they've proven that after that training, you go back to the same scenes of empathic distress, of seeing people in trouble, and when you've been trained in their positive compassion, I'll call it, you, you have a totally different reaction to the, the same pictures. You focus on the love you feel for that person, not pain. I mean, that's remarkable, right? You know, they, they, they've proven that. So it turns out that what, what all the philosophers and the religious practitioners were suggesting for thousands of years works. Because so much of prayer, when you really think about it, is a rehearsal com continually of certain kinds of positive qualities, if you, if you do it right. So I think that it's, it, I think the evidence is overwhelming that people can get better at this. Yeah. Well, on the, on the 
assumption that better late than never then. Yes. Um, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be useful, I, I have been, I was teaching anger management for a while, and uh, ever since then I've thought that, you know, students should be, shouldn't be able to graduate from high school without some positive training, positive right. anger management. It makes all the difference. Right. They see why it's so different. Yes, and, and the, other, the other interesting thing is that we're coming, there's a com an interesting confluence between, uh, there's so many of us are refugees from organized religion and from organized Judaism. And we're refugees because basically it was up to every one of those brains in the past, the rabbis and teachers and, and people who organized the community, on what to emphasize was the religion. And we, we ended up in this system, in this perpetual state of war with Christianity and victimhood from Christianity, where we emphasize what makes us different. So it's the tzitzis, and it's the kashras, and it's the shabbos, and anything that's different. Everything that's, and I, and I live with a lot of my, my family, where I'll talk about compassion. And I, I, I you know, some of my Haredi cousins said, isn't that a goyish thing? As <laughs> I, I, I went through the floor, if I could open up the floor and go through it, I would do that. You know, it's like, isn't that a goyish thing? And I realized that, would, but that was in essence the issue. That 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 for her, the Jewishness had become everything that's opposite the goy. And and many many people. So we, we so a lot of us with the universal instincts, common sense, we run like hell for the doors. But in the process, we've also surrendered religion to a certain kind of thinking, which is usually nativist, withdrawn hateful of the world in all the major religions. It's not, it's not a unique problem to Judaism. So the thing is that that you, that I'm getting to a point about somebody called the Chafetz Chaim. Mm -hmm. Contradiction in terms. The Chafetz Chaim was this person who gave us the most restrictive practical book you could possibly imagine, the Mishnah Berurah, that was crazy on stringencies that kept you away from everything in the world. And yet, he wrote three volumes of the most amazing psychological literature on the examination of each word in our vocabulary. The sanctity of every word. It's an old, old Jewish idea. And I'm working with people in conflict resolution now, Howard Kaminsky, an Orthodox thinker who wrote an amazing book on Judaism and conflict resolution with the details of the laws of watching your mouth. And it turns out that George Lakoff, also a Jew, who's a great neuroscientist retired from Berkeley, he has taught me that every single word that we say changes our biochemistry. So even the word teaching anger management, what we're, you know, what, what, what the, the Dalai Lama would say, or especially Thich Nhat Hanh would say, teaching patience. Because the moment we say the word angry, a lot of us get angry. The, you know, that, that, that we're, we're starting to see the power of the positive, the power of the imagery, and the thing that pe things that people evoke in our minds. So yes, I do believe in, in teaching this, and that it could be a fantastic experience. I watch every word now that I say to people to not trigger. Even the word conflict resolution was poison in Syria because the, the officials, everybody said, we have no conflicts here. <laughs> you know, so the word conflict was, was, was offensive and threatening. So we focused on diplomacy, we focused on public relations. So we all have to work at how we create an educational, inclusive atmosphere that is non-threatening and that has the kind of words that are going to be invitational. But I believe everybody should have that anger management training. So, yeah. just change the word, because he doesn't mean what we mean in English by gossip. What we mean by gossip is innocent fun of saying, you know what happened to Joy me? You know, that's, that's, that's gossip. 
what he means is slander. Okay, yeah. And I can tell you from academia that slander is, is worse than a machine gun. It poisons atmospheres, especially when we, we call it conflict avoidance in our field, which means that you avoid the conflict by poisoning everybody else with, with talk. And you get even with people by talk. We all know there are people around like that. It creates toxicity, and that's what the fuck it's time was talking about. When the Talmud says that that's akin to murder, that's what they were talking about, not gossip. Gossip is fun, we all find out about each other, and that's not, that's not the essence of what's going on. Yeah, I think, um, was there anybody over here? Okay, um, so, uh, first meal in the area. One of the things that, um, when you were talking about the Muslim Brotherhood, you gave that as an example of them swooping in and taking advantage of the power vacuum to, right. um, to take control. It occurs to me that um, what you're talking about here is really not in the interest of either the incumbent power structure or other organized aspiring incumbent, incumbent power groups, structure. and therefore um, could be quite challenging to get this to really take off. It sounds like it has to be something from the grassroots because no one in power is going to be particularly interested in Yes, and it also has to be this kind of thing. Right, and it also has to be uh, the other thing that, how shall I put this? The truly successful ideas in history, both the good ones and the evil ones, have a sense of the beyond. They have a sense of going beyond your 20 year years of power and inaction. And that the success we've had, and I have to tell you from the field, you know, working with very conservative women, fully dressed in black, that the excitement that they feel with practicing a fingerprint and an argument in a democratic assembly, and, and registering what their vote is and then arguing. The, the, the hypnotic nature of the democratic idea, which basically is an illusion, there's, no, there's nothing in, his, in, in life that says that democracy is a reality. We make it a reality. And for 300 years, we've been making this concept of human rights into a reality. It's the most hypnotic idea out there. Never seen anything like it. So that's a competition in the brain between that kind of mental construct and other mental constructs. And so you, you get in there, but you can't, you can't get in there thinking that, you can't get in there with the mobilization idea that okay, we mobilize and everything's gonna be okay with Assad or with uh, you know, the Republican Party. You know, so we mobilize and everything and 51% of people are gonna just go away. Or 40%. It's like a, it's, a, it's a delusion that's dangerous because these commitments have to be more of a sense of, of contributing to history, contributing to the evolution of a concept that has had good legs and some good successes, but has also had some danger to it, and we need to keep passing it on in a more effective way. Those are the, the, those, that kind of organization and mobilization seems to be what works uh, the best. Almost surrendering on the present sometime, and I don't mean walking home, I mean being dogged about something without building yourself up for disappointment. Mm -hmm. It's very important that disappointment doesn't tyrannize the brain. Because that also, that empathy with loss and suffering can just devastate you. Yes? What are the main takeaways uh, from your approach for the current very polarized uh, situation in the US or in the UK or in other similar uh, cases? Practical. Well, yeah, so the practical realities of what I'm what I think is uh, necessary to be done is that people have, especially because I've studied these different, these different ethical theories that, that, that really have been around for thousands of years, um, they suggest that, that multiple approaches to social change are essential because no one approach can solve all problems and every approach has its, its, its drawbacks. So that in practical reality, there's no question that that some people should always be focused on the rule of law and on reforming the rule of law and of moving legislation more and more towards revolutionary approaches to uh, global, uh, global sustainability. Uh, like I, you know, we all know that the climate, climate disaster is the legacy we have is some people should be working exclusively on, on innovative approaches to new energy and to zero carbon 
that have that translate into law. Some people should be doing that. Other people should be focusing on uh, on on anti-racism because each one of these has a virtue to it. But all I'm adding to that is that some people should be working on reconciliation between people who think that they are in polar opposite camps. And when I say this to people, they assume I mean give up on all the other legislative items, all of the other struggles. No, I'm not talking about giving up on those struggles. What I'm saying is that some people need to work on creating community across, uh, across enemy lines. That caring for your enemy is a Jewish principle. Whatever you've heard about it being in the New Testament, it is in the New Testament. Jesus was a rabbi. It's in Exodus 23. But there is great, great virtue, and I can tell you the cognitive dissonance, the surprise and shock. One of the things that lights up the whole brain in a moment, you know why clowns light up the whole brain? We don't know. All I know is that shock reorganizes the brain. Now, that can be good and bad. It's an opportunity for healing, like uh, Maz Jobrani. Anybody follow Maz Jobrani? The Iranian-American comedian? He does great work between Sunni and Shia and Americans and people in the Midwest. See some of his, his uh, com comedy routines, right? He's shocking everybody, he gets everybody, he has this routine uh, about, about uh, how people in the Middle East, some people, some people kiss once, some people kiss twice, some people kiss three times, and you know, and, the, and the, by the third time, some people, if it's not their custom, think that you're coming on to them. So he has this whole routine saying, no man, I don't want that third one, you know, and he's getting, so he has all these Sunni and Shia in the audience, uh, in the audience laughing at each other. And it creates shock, positive shock, that leads to a new ethic that is universalized between those people who watch that. So that's a good shock. Bad shock is, is Donald Trump. His personality, and many demagogic personalities, the Brazilian leader now, their, their excellence is in shocking you and disempowering you in the same instance. Because every time you break a boundary that never used to be broken, you're, you get shocked. And in that space of shock, it can be a space that makes you um, want to withdraw, terrified, frightened, beaten, right? So we have to face what we have, but realize that there are many, many people on, on opposite sides who don't know each other. The, the, the Quran has a great expression where God says, I made you into many peoples in order so that you should come to know each other which is a great idea when you think about it. This diversity is there to come to know the sacredness in others. And we have similar ideas in Jewish tradition. Some people should be working on that. And, and doing it in a way that does not focus on winning a fight, but more on compassion, respect, honor, and seeing where that goes. That's so many people have been doing that in Israel-Palestine for 30 years, they never get support. And um, in that case, there's too many people, there's too many players that insist on the war continuing for them to have any kind of traction. But that, but they're doing the right thing by coming to know each other. And uh, Dalia Shainman just came out with an amazing poll about the, the differences between Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis on this subject and how, how the vast majority of Arab Israelis simply want to be citizens of Jewish Israel, equal citizens of Jewish Israel. And how many uh, young people have been successfully brainwashed to want to see them forced out. And these are citizens. We're talking about a million people. So there's a, a virtue in this country before civil war, to some people making it uh, their task to sit with people with who voted for terrible people and at the same time come to know them as people and see what principles, because the moment we stop talking about voting, we find that actually many people want the same thing. They all want an environment that's not toxic. They all want education that's good. They want many things together, but somehow they still vote for these crazy people. 
because we're in a polarized tribal situation and people follow their tribe. So some people have to develop the talent to do that, to go to ethics and not politics. Others should go to politics. That's the way I would argue that. Because some politics is based on ethics of what universally is right, and some behavior should be focused on ethics as if politics didn't exist. Somebody had their hand up. Yes? How did Germany do it so quickly? Yeah, this, uh, I think we should study it more. Um, my wife is German-American, and she's done a lot of thinking about it. She lived in Germany, and every time something insane goes on here, she says, that's not how we were brought up in Germany. You know, and it's so dissonant to my ears, but it's, it's true, so you couldn't get away with saying that, you know, and, and this and that, and so something happened differently in the educational system that was completely different than the rest of Europe and the United States. There was a very, very, she, she was horrified by flags and by patriotism. She said, we didn't grow up with patriotism. They didn't hate the country, but they didn't think that this is something that you worship. You don't worship the flag. That was a legacy. See, that was a legacy. The legacy is that, that flags can be toxic. But it wasn't, in America, if you say that the flag is toxic, it, you know, it sounds like you're hating veterans. On the contrary, we know what the facts are about who cares for veterans. But somehow the flag becomes this symbol. The Bible calls it idolatry. I'm sorry to be partisan. That as if the, the flag is the country. That's already a certain stage. And she didn't grow up with that in terms. But we, don't, we didn't do that. That wasn't how we thought. We, we, were, taught, we were taught to question authority. We were taught to, to deliberate. Wow. That sounds like, you know, like my, my professors from the 1950s at Columbia University. You know, Louis Henkin, Sidney Morgenbesser, all of these great, great uh, intellectuals who built the human rights agenda. So there is a, a way in which we've all been sucked into something much more primitive. And other countries that learned a terrible lesson and were sort of got rid of their fascists and wanted to build something different. And that, and that has, been standing true in, in Germany in a way that it is completely failing in other countries around them, because most countries did not take any responsibility for the fascism of World War II, for their role in that. Absolute denial, and that's very dangerous. Perhaps one of the reasons why we have such troubles in this country is that we have 70 years of war now, you know, between, I'm not just 70, 70, 40 years of war between Afghanistan and Iraq, and we never, we still haven't finished the Civil War. We still haven't faced slavery. We still haven't faced the fate of Native Americans and said sorry as a country. And that kind of burying of the past seems to rebuild denial in the present and alternate realities. And once you're into alternate realities, like Albright, uh, very, very dangerous things happen in alt realities. Uh, and there's something about the empiricism, the beauty of facing facts and then moving to a different relationship, like, like the corner in the kindergarten. And what if there was no corner in the kindergarten? And all these little kids are, they, they have suppressed memories of somebody who hurt them. It, it, all took, it, it all translates into something else. And before you know it, you have a very toxic kindergarten. So th there's a way in which bringing things up into reality, for Germany at least, worked. So we ought to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I have received very much on the personal level what you said about the kindergarten mediation corner, because uh, on the daily basis, uh, what, what you say is uh, if I am frustrated, disappointed, or whatever anger comes to me, I'm trying to um, retreat, cool down, instead to face immediately, to jump on <clears throat> it's, very, it's like uh, when you are angry to some and uh, you write an email, don't press the set. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. And when you write it, press, okay, just leave it there. I'll just press it. And that helps. Oh, absolutely. And then you go to someone right. else and say, okay, let's go outside, let's talk, let's go for a walk with yes. this guy, and let's get away from the situation so that we could. Uh, 
it seems that the, the quickness of publication, which became this great tool of Twitter and Facebook and others, it turns out to be uh, extremely bad for the brain. Uh, brain systems of natural self-control. And it sounds simple and it's, gee, we, you know, we can, but no, actually we underestimated how much all of us are in better control in that long way of composing a letter, should I send it, should I not send it, you know, I'm gonna start with a new version and all of that. And, and think about all of that brain work that goes into that moment as opposed to what's happening now. And then you can be a little bit more compassionate and forgiving for how primitive uh, some of these things have become. Yeah. yeah. So you briefly mentioned the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh as opposed to the, all the other Western sources. I was wondering if you had any um, other Buddhist or Eastern sources that were particularly helpful with the kind of analysis that we did. Well, I could say, I, I mean, there's a, a fellow by the name of Matthew Ricard. Yes. And Matthew is, was the subject of Olga's experiment. So uh, I, I think, so many, many it, it, Tibetan Buddhists uh, are the ones that have developed the most advanced forms of compassion training over their lifetimes. And so they studied their brain waves and they studied what they were. So I think what's remarkable about the research though is that it takes a lot less than we think it does. You know, we're, th there's, there are things here on both sides. One, and this is, comes back to the Stanley Mil Milgram experiments, which I always mention. I am post-Holocaust, I am thinking about this all the time. One of the remarkable things is how easy it is to get people en masse to do something terrible. So you've all read Lord of the Flies, maybe, and, and, and you know, that, that's reality. That's reality in, in, in any, in any uh, department, in any school, in any, any village. But the opposite is the case, too. It's amazing how how contagious it is to teach compassion and meditate on compassion and practice it and how it changes. Like they've done this with uh, subways, closed subways when somebody was being attacked and the different ways in which you see people responding to that. It's really cool to watch. So many people have common sense. So many people have good, good, good instincts in bad situations. And, and, and we, we, we don't need Matthew, you know, Matthew Ricard is wonderful, but, but a lot of us have this. We just need to be self-conscious of those skills and share them with people and make them conscious in the higher brain. Not just an accident in case the metro breaks down, but something that we actually say, this is part of our evolution as humanity. This is part of our spirituality. This is part of, our, this is part of what it is to be an American. You know, redefining who you are. So can you just uh, put in words what would be the, the way to act in such a, such a situation that you're, you're talking that this is how we should do it? You mean like the... Uh, in the subway. The subway? Yeah. So I've seen various, I mean this is a very interesting question, but I've seen one, one video that was fascinating where um, one woman was attacking another with an umbrella. She lost control, she started threatening with an umbrella and with her keys, it was a New York Metro. And it was very interesting to see. Like if I was there, because I, I do have, I come from a very angry environment, I, I, I get angry and I start defending the victim. My, my problem is, is that I'm too quick to defend victims in a very emotional way. But a lot of people on that train didn't do that. They, they started moving a little bit towards getting in between the woman who was aggressing and the woman who was being attacked. And then they made harumphs. You know how you know harumphs? Yeah. Like the films? It's like, huh, you know, it's like that's not cool, lady, you know, and all of this. And they just sort of very nonviolent. And as a group, they started just protecting the victim. Now, other times, when there's actual weapons involved, we've seen people die as a result. And it's an open question as to what to do to intervene when somebody has a weapon. Yeah. It's not always the because, because the, ethic, the great ethical theories, going back thousands of years, including Torah theory, is that your life and care for yourself is part of the mitzvah. You have to calculate what's gonna be safe for your families. It may depend on who you're with. Are you with your wife? Are you with your children? Or are you alone? In terms of how you calculate what to do in a, in a crazy situation. So I've seen a lot of wisdom of average people reacting differently and we should study that. I'm not gonna say I have the answer, I'm saying we have the answers. Because many of us 
are very advanced in this. And we should learn from each other and make it a subject of training, make it an open exercise. What would you do in the metro? The metro's closed, broken down, and this person starts harassing that person. What are the options? And see what 20 kids say. And then move from there, you know? Because then your brain is ready if it does happen. Imagine if we're all prepared rather than taken by surprise. Yeah? On an optimistic note about that subject, um, people believe, I think, that it's human nature, that if there's a natural disaster or something, we all look out for ourselves and you know there's chaos and we do horrible things to each other. But there's a fantastic book by Rebecca Solnit called Paradise in Hell. She studied natural disasters and looked really carefully at the documentation that stories came out, like with Katrina, for example, that people were horrible to each other. It turned out to be either really exceptional or not true. Yes. And that overwhelmingly, yes. until that things get bad when the police come in. But before that happens, when yes. it's totally chaos, people are really good to each other. And yes. it's so uplifting to read because they're fantastic stories from the San Francisco earthquake, from right. this horrible disaster in Halifax. Right. Um, now that's really, really good literature to read and also be aware. And this is. The, the amygdala is highly profitable. So all of our social media, going back thousands of years, has great benefit by emphasizing the horror, by emphasizing the dark side. It is money, big, big money. Clickbait is not just a nice word. It's a real, real money maker. And every single op-ed page, we, we should have known this already in the days of the National Enquirer. It's out of control because of how wealth producing, the, the rage, making people enraged at the rage of others. So that's what you see in Katrina. You don't see the thousands of people who are helping each other from rooftops, et cetera, et cetera. You don't film that as much. Sometimes you do, but you don't see it as much. We have to reorient ourselves and our brain towards that, those positive stories because this is not about being Pollyannish. This is actually about repairing what reality really is and not being manipulated into, into the negative. We kind of recreate our own worst nightmares by emphasizing the worst in us. Yeah? Can I ask you something? Because it made me think of, I'm in the school, okay, and they have um, a pretend that there is a fire or there is a somebody yes. you know, coming in. And they teach the kids what they need to do. And I honestly think that the only thing that they're installing in there is fear. It's fear. Uh, yes. And it's so traumatic. Yes. Instead of explaining a different way to do this. And I had a conversation with some teachers, and I'm going to do it in my camp too. Like they, they don't tell me when they're going to set the alarm. They don't tell me what is going to happen. I need to stop and run. And when I do it with the kids in the camp, it's just I need, what I do is prepare the kids before so this is not, you know, a shock. Because it really is traumatic. It's traumatic for this. Well, they're, they're covering the but law. they're doing this in every single school. They want to, they they want to protect the law. And because oh. we can't, we because in at least a number of states, we can't change the laws about the guns and the gun availability. The the reaction is to uh, this is about arming the classroom. It's not arming them with guns. It's arming them with uh, with uh, self defense. Uh, but it, and it has to be done in a state of shock. So a lot of things are being militarized uh, in our society. It's not surprising that the world's policemen, after 40 years of war. I don't know if you know this, but billions of dollars of military equipment that is sitting idle is every every few years you hear that the military is trying to sell advanced weaponry to all the police departments. This is an example. So the militarization of 20 years, the people wanting, running around with PTSD from Afghanistan and Iraq are often police officers. There's a blue wall that says that we're not going to just let you go with the bad apples. There's a lot of things that, that just we just get used to a militarized situation between, you know, white nationalists on one side, uh, cops who are have PTSD themselves. I was stopped by a cop uh, not long after 9/11. I was sitting on a street in Silver Spring, texting. It was in the dark. It was next to a house. Somebody must have called the police. Guy comes up behind me with his lights blaring, and I was just sitting there. 
comes out. He's got, you know, he's got like this. Yeah. And he's looking at me and he says, what are you doing? I, I, I felt he needed a Xanax. I said, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was traumatized by the fact that I was sitting there and somebody called because he was scared out of his wits. And this is very often the people who shoot first are the ones who are the most traumatized. So this is the situation we're in. And the question is, is there anything to be done to ameliorate it? So of course you're right that this shouldn't be happening. But the, but the real question is, can we do anything differently? So I would say for these poor kids who are growing up with this, try to have drills for something else. Try to say, we're gonna have a drill today by, let, let's say one of you has an accident, what are we all gonna do? How are we all gonna help? Well, we just found out that this family is going to lose their house. That's how we drill. What are we all gonna do? You know, try to reform the concept of drilling, not to shock, but to plan on what mobilization is, how to help. The same way following on that Katrina situation. If there's a flood coming down here, what are we all gonna do for each other? And see if that drilling can help the brain have at least options on looking at drilling in a less violent, terrifying way. It's the only thing I can make. I yes, you haven't spoken. Okay, that, you haven't spoken yet. That makes me wonder about a lot of us here who grew up in the 50s hiding under our desks yes. and yes. Air yes. Air <laughs> going out into the hall and hovering along the wall. Yeah. Yes. So what has that done? It, it, did, it, it was obviously uh, a government that knew it couldn't protect you and wanted to give you something to do and say, we're sa you're, you're safe as long as you do X, Y, and Z. So, but by now, what's happened? What are the effects on us yeah. now? It's more, it's more real for these kids because, in fact, they are being shot. There are, more, there are more children being shot in this country than police officers and military. <laughs> There's more deaths by shooting of, of children and youth than there are in the classrooms than there are uh, of yes. police. So, yeah. But today, for us who went yeah. through that, I'm trying to figure out what's happened. What's happened as a result of that? Yeah. As a result of that. Yeah. Reflect on it. <laughs> yes. So Tell just, me when the last just, question should be. Yeah, maybe, maybe this question or another. Okay. So it's not, it's not really a question. I would like to speak on behalf of the schools. As a teacher, I'm very fond of the notion of uh, education as subversive acts. But I, I, I will tell you that almost every new Hungarian kind of public school has adopted restorative justice in the past year as a, as a movement. And many people think of restorative justice as being just what, kids, what happens when kids do something wrong, but it's really not. And what we're teaching in the school right now um, is how to create safe spaces for kids and how to have mediation corners. And I'm, I'm going to a training this week on creating safe spaces for students. I'll be doing training on restorative justice about creating community so that we, are, we have circles where we talk about exactly that kind of thing and how we re retrain our kids and think about drills in a different way and all of those things. So I've gotten some good ideas from the questions. But it is happening in small ways. And if Restorative right. justice is a whole new movement. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say it came out of my field. Um, it has become uh, uh, contagious. Um, but what I fear, and this is where I have to, this is where the task is yet to be done. There's a consistent pattern going back at least 100 years that people in, in pluralistic cosmopolitan zip codes and this is tr as true in Hungary as it is here, consistently are going in one very advanced way towards acceptance and tolerance and compassion, and the people around them in the rural areas are being completely left out and in fact are going in the opposite direction, which explains the Holocaust to a T. It explains how Poland could be a place where the ultra-Orthodox Jews had their own political parties in the parliament, and at the same time, the eagerness to kill Jews in the rural countryside. It can be both true, right? So we, in the zip codes that are progressive, really have to realize that just a few zip codes away in Harrisonburg, Virginia, my friend, my, my friends who are the only Jewish uh, family, you know, the white nationalists are stopping by their house and watching them and following them. 
just uh, two hours away. So there's, there's two things going on that are opposite. And if we can put politics aside and subversively reach out to another zip code and say, hey, we have a great thing for kids, what do you think? And see if you can get one parent in those, those geographic places that are different, it can sidestep the racism, anti-racism, the, the, the blue-red, the, the Fox CNN. We have to figure out this boundary because this boundary is what led, is what led to genocides throughout the world, is the manipulation of people who are not cosmopolitan or rural or miserable and angry that they're left out of society. You know what I heard from uh, somebody in Saskatchewan who is in conflict resolution? She tells me at a conference that I was at that they just took away all the bus service in rural Saskatchewan. The liberals in the capital just took it away. All those people now can't get anywhere. <laughs> and they're all rural, and they all hate immigrants, and now, now they're just gonna get worse. And why wouldn't a liberal in Toronto get that? Because we're in a binary. Because cosmopolitan is all the way from Vienna. The people in Vienna detested the people in the countryside until the Nazis came along and empowered those people in the countryside, you see? So you can't, we can't survive contempt. Maybe that's a negative way to say it. We really need to evolve to the next step of, of seeing the humanity in those who are not in a cosmopolitan environment. Seeing their needs, listening to them, seeing which positive ideas denuded of politics can reach out and achieve the same thing for the brain and the heart uh, that, that many of our new innovations are doing. So, um, one more? Uh, one more? What do you, what do you I'm wondering, it's a kind of uh, tough question in a way, but maybe not tough. If you have one mes a message to give to a child as they're growing up, what would you say? Yeah, uh, my, 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 uh, I have a rabbi friend, Bruce Aft, and he just says, be kind, you know? And it's, and it's, it's the old Yiddish phrase, hot rachmanos, you know? Is that I think, I think that that notion, you know why it captures it? Because it's, you articulated it with words, which means it's in your neocortex, but it's appealing to the, all of those places of compassion in your brain. I just think that the one, the one um, innovation now that I see because of the research is that it, 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 it's, it's not have pity. This pity is a negative feeling of I feel sad for them. It's, it's be kind, which is more active and loving. And that's why Bruce is, is right about that. And if we could just say that as teachers, as parents, more and more and more, um, I think that we create a culture. Okay. That's great. That's great.